Good morning, everyone. You all doing okay? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, it's slightly ironic that I'm, I'm talking about stress today, and I was just telling my colleagues that I've walked into the venue about nine minutes ago, rushing late, getting here from Cheshire, which is probably not the ideal preparation. Um, but I'm feeling pretty calm, and I, I really do want to spend the next 20 minutes talking to you about what I think is possibly the most serious, but also undervalued um, components of our health, and, and that is stress. So stress is the health epidemic of the 21st century. Now, that's not me who's saying that. Does anyone know who says that? The, well, yeah, maybe the UN does. Uh, I've seen it on the World Health Organization website. And I think that's pretty striking statements because they're not saying that about our poor diets, although that's clearly an issue. They're not saying that about physical inactivity, although that's clearly an issue, but they're saying that about stress. Now, there was a paper published in 2013 in the Journal of the American Medical Association that suggested that between 70 and 90% of what a GP like me sees in any given day is in some way related to stress. Does that surprise you? Yeah, see, this is, and whenever I ask a question, it's always a mix. Half of the people saying, yeah, that's really surprising, half of people saying no. Um, and I th for me, when I read it, it was quite surprising until I started to review the patients that came in and, and had to think about what was driving, actually, their real health. And the reality is, I think it's true. I think it's spot on. Because as a GP, I see symptoms every day, such as insomnia, poor memory, hormonal problems, inability to concentrate, uh, low libido, gut problems, even things like obesity, type 2 diabetes. And actually, all of those things, they might seem quite unrelated and quite separate, but you can make a very good case that all of them have stress as a key, key driver. So why is that? How can stress cause such a diverse range of symptoms? Well, to understand it, you just have to go back maybe two million years ago or so when our stress response was evolving. Because once you understand what stress is, you can start to apply that understanding to all the stressful episodes that you might experience in your life and the impacts they're going to have on your body. So let's go back a couple of million years ago. We are in our hunter-gatherer tribe, in our little community, going along with our business, and then there's a predator attacking. Let's say a lion is lurking. So what happens? Well, in an instant, our stress response kicks into gear. A series of physiological changes and biochemical changes all over your body kick in with one goal, to help keep you safe. Right, so what happens? Well, many things happen, but to give you an idea, your blood sugar will start to rise. That's going to help you run faster. That's going to help deliver more glucose to your brain. That's a good thing if you're running away from a lion. What else happens? Your blood pressure goes up. Your blood pressure, again, is going to deliver more oxygen to your brain. That's a good thing. There's a part of your brain called the amygdala. Okay, that's part of your emotional brain. That goes on to high alert. Right, so you're hypervigilant for all the threats around you. Again, that's a good thing in the short term. What else happens? Your blood becomes prone to clotting. Right? That means if you were to get cut and attacked by that predator, instead of bleeding to death, your blood's going to clot and that's going to keep you safe. Right? These are fantastic mechanisms that help us in the short term. The problem today is that for many of us, our stress responses are not being activated by real danger. Right? They're not being activated by lions and predators. For many of us, they're being activated by our daily lives, by our email inboxes, our to-do lists, conflicting demands, two parents working, one trying to finish early, go home, pick the kids up, three social media channels we're trying to stay on top of, elderly parents who might also be having to look after. The list goes on, but for many of us, those same things right, are driving the same stress response. 
And it's problematic because in the short term, those things are really helpful, but in the long term, they're a problem. So your blood sugar going up in the short term to help you run faster, if that's happening day in, day out, right, that's going to lead to excess weight, ultimately type 2 diabetes, just from being stressed. Blood pressure. We know high blood pressure is a big problem. In the short term, a good thing. You're running away from a line. If you're in a spinning class at the weekend, you want your blood, sh- uh, your blood pressure to rise. That's an appropriate response to a short-term stressor. But day in, day out, if your life is stressing you out, the high blood pressure is going to increase your risk of getting heart attacks, strokes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about your emotional brain, the amygdala? Right? Again, I said, when you're being stressed and you're running away from that lion, it becomes, it goes on to high alerts. You're hypervigilant for all those threats around you. Appropriate in that environment. Appropriate if tonight you're walking down a dark London street and you think someone is trying to attack you. You want to be hypervigilant. But if that's happening day in, day out to your life and your email inbox, right? Well, that's one of the things that we call anxiety. You see, all these things in the short term help us, but in the, in the long term, they can be very, very problematic. So as well as those things that actually the stress response switches on, what about some of those things that switches off? Well, as a GP, I can tell you today, even more than five years ago, we're seeing more and more cases of low libido. And we're seeing it in younger and younger people. And there are many, many reasons for this. But stress is one of the main drivers. So why would that be? Well, if you are in danger and you are running away from a lion, you don't need to be able to chill out and procreate with your partner. So your body switches it off. Yeah. Gut problems. A survey by Mintel suggested that 80% of the UK population in any given year suffer from at least one gastrointestinal complaint. They are so, so common. And everyone goes to food as the key driver, and food is clearly a significant uh, player here. But I've got to tell you, stress is an even bigger driver than the food that we're eating. Running away from a lion, the last thing you need to do is be able to digest your food. And how many of us right, and I include myself in this, are having our healthy lunch while we're also trying to juggle a million things and answer emails at the same time. I'm sure nobody in here dreams of doing anything like that, but certainly that's, that's something we're all faced with. So once you understand what the stress response is, you start to understand how it can affect so many different complaints. Now, I actually contend that it's not that hard to manage the stress off the modern world, okay? It's getting harder and harder, but I think there are some simple strategies. And that's why I wrote my book, The Stress Solution, because I don't think stress is getting the airtime it deserves. I think when we talk about health and well-being, the, the, the conversation is dominated with diet and exercise. And of course, they're important. But more often than not, stress is the reason why we're choosing the diets and choosing those to be physically inactive. You know, how many people in January want to give up sugar or give up alcohol, right? It's common. And for a week or two, you know, they might manage it. But then what often happens is that the sugar or the alcohol was there to soothe the stress in your life. So if you don't address the underlying stressor, you're very, very unlikely to change the behavior long term. So look, I cover... In, the, in my book, I cover all the simple strategies that you would expect, like breathing meditation, nature, all kinds of things that absolutely do help. Meaning and purpose and give tips on how you can start to get meaning and purpose in your life. But I want to touch on two areas today that I think aren't spoken about enough of in the context of stress. The first one is loneliness. Okay? So loneliness is on the rise. Some people say that we're we're living in a loneliness epidemic. And when we talk about loneliness, we immediately start to think of the elderly. And I understand that. I understand that loneliness affects a lot of the elderly, and it is a problem. But one of the loneliest groups in society are young men between the ages of 30 and 45. 
And at this age group, tragically, there are growing, growing rates of mental health problems, growing rates of male suicide. In fact, it was just a few days ago, it was National Suicide Prevention Day. And it's a big problem in that age group, and loneliness is a key driver of that. You see, we're living these ultra-connected lives, right? And we say we're more connected than we've ever been before. And sure, in a digital sense, I think that's true. But in terms of real, deep, human connection, I don't think we've ever been this isolated. Recent research is suggesting that the feeling of being lonely is as harmful as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Does that surprise people? Yeah, most of you nodding your head. So why would that be? Why would the feeling of being lonely be that damaging for you? Well, it all makes sense if you go back a couple of million years ago, right? Back when we were in our hunter-gatherer tribes, if you are by yourself, you're not part of that supportive community, your body's smart. Your body knows that you are vulnerable to attack. So it prepares you for that. It ramps up your immune system. It makes you inflamed. It makes your blood prone to clotting. It does all of these things so that if you do get attacked, you can protect yourself. The problem is now, in this era where we're so busy, we don't have time to see our friends. We don't have time to do the things that mean the world to us and see those people. You know, our bodies are reacting in the same way. It was just last year I had a patient who came to see me, a 37-year-old chap. And on the outside, he was really, really successful. He was running his own business, self-employed, he drove a sports car. You know, you would have thought, hey, this, this guy's got it all together. He came to see me and he said, uh, Dr. Chastity, look, I'm, I'm a bit worried here. I'm, I struggle to get out of bed some days. I'm struggling to, to stay focused at work. I'm really struggling with motivation, and and I'm really worried that I've got something called depression. You know, can you help me? So I spent time talking to him, trying to understand what was going on in his life. We did do a few tests and and investigations. Everything came back normal. And as I was getting to know him, I realized that actually he was quite lucky in the sense that he lived in a village where he grew up. And he had lots of his friends around him, but he never actually saw them. He was too busy. He said, you know, I see what they're up to on social media. And that's, that's the funny thing about social media, right, isn't it? You can see what your friends are up to. You can see the holiday snaps. You can see where they were last night. You can see what they had for dinner last night, right? But you don't actually see them. And I said to him, look, what I'd love you to try is, for the next six weeks, I'd like to see one of your friends at least once a week in person, and when you're with them, I want you to put your phone away. Be really, really present for that interaction. He said, yeah, sure, okay, give that a go. So he goes away, I see him in clinic six weeks later, and I ask him, I said, how are you getting on? He said, Dr. Chashi, I feel like a different person. I can't tell you the difference it's made. I feel motivated, my self-esteem has improved, I'm more productive at work, and my concentration's better. I said, well, what did you do? He said, the first time, the first couple of times, I played five-a-side football with my friends, which we haven't done in years. But then after that, all we did is on a Sunday morning, we'd go to the local cafe and chew the fat over a latte. So, you know, my question is, did, did that young lad, well, not young lad, did that young man have a mental health problem? I mean, he certainly had symptoms that would be consistent with mental health diagnoses, potentially. But was it not that what he really had was a deficiency of friendship in his life? And when he corrected that friendship deficiency, other things started to come back online for him. Now, I'm not trying to say this happens in every single case, right? Medication has a role at times. I do happen to think we are over-medicating people up and down the country with a whole variety of basically lifestyle-driven symptoms. I certainly think that's happening in medicine today. But isn't that powerful? So my, my question to all of you in here is to ask yourself, when was the last time you saw one of your friends in person? Right? 
Because I say that seeing your friends in, in person is not a, um, how could I put it? It's not a luxury for good health. It's a necessity. And if you haven't got a date in the diary, if you haven't seen them recently, maybe at your coffee break or your lunch break, send them a text. Put a date in the diary. It is good for your health. Right? Prioritize it in the same way that you would prioritize eating your vegetables with your dinner. And it's something that I think the modern world, as it steals more and more time away from us, seeing our friends is something that actually, for many of us, falls by the wayside. The other issue I want to talk to you about, which I don't think has been spoken about in the context of stress and, and well-being, is passion. Right, so the research is pretty clear on this. Regularly doing things that you love makes you more resilient to stress. Right? And we are living in stressful times. So, you know, yes, we would ideally reduce how much stress is in our lives, but that can be challenging. So making ourselves more resilient to stress is a fantastic way of tackling this. Right? So regularly doing things you learn makes you more resilient to stress, but it works both ways. Being chronically stressed makes it harder for you to experience pleasure in day-to-day -day things. Right? Your brain is always responding to the information that you feed it. So, I'll give you another story. 53-year-old chap came into my clinic. Okay? He's uh, the local CFO of a plastics company, very successful job. Um, and again, he's concerned that he might have depression. He says, Dr. Chashi, I just, I just feel indifferent. I'm, I just can't get going. I don't have time to do the things I want to do. I, I'm just disinterested in my job, in my work, in my family life. Is this depression? So I started to ask him about his life. You know, what's going on? You know, so you've been married for 20 years. Okay, how's your marriage? Yeah, so, so. You know, I don't really see my wife that much, but things are okay. You know, he was very, very indifferent about it. So what about work? You've got a good job. Do you enjoy it? <coughs> really? It pays the bills. I've got to do it. You know, puts a roof over our heads. I said, do you do anything that you love? You know, what, what do you do to, to, as, as sort of recreation? I said, dog, I don't have time for that. I'm busy. So what about weekends? Weekends, I've got the household chores to do, I've got to take the kids to sports classes, I don't have time. So, you know, again, I did what is appropriate off me as a GP to, to sort of check other aspects of his life. But then I, I started to really push him on this passion piece. I said, have you, did you ever have any hobbies? So, doctor, I used to have hobbies, yeah. As a teenager, I used to love train sets. I used to play with them loads. I said, okay, do you have a train set at home? He said, yeah, well, I've got one at home, but it's in the loft. I said, okay, look, what I'd love you to do tonight is when you get home, let's get your train set out. <laughs> I appreciate that may not be the advice that he was expecting to get uh, from his GP, but nonetheless, that's the advice I gave him. Then he goes away, and I get on with my day. And as Typically, how much in general practice, you cannot follow up every single patient that you see. We see sometimes 40 to 50 patients a day. You cannot follow them all up. So I hadn't seen him for a while. Three months later, I finished my morning surgery. I was in the car park, about to go out to do my home, uh, home visits, and I bumped into his wife, and I said, hey, look, you know, how's, um, how's your husband getting on? He said, oh, my God, Dr. Chesley, I feel like I've, I've got the guy I married back again. I said, well, what's been going on? He said, well, I come home from work, and no, he comes home from work, and he's straight away playing around on his toy set. He's on eBay buying collector's items, um, and, he's, and he's subscribed to this magazine now, and he's, he's just so happy. Now, I didn't see him for another three months when he came in for a well man's check, and he came in to see me with his blood results. And uh, I remember him coming in, and I said, hey, look, how are you getting on? He says, Doc, I cannot tell you the difference Things are so much better. I love that train set. Um, and I said, what about, you know, what, how's your, how's your uh, marriage? He goes, things with my wife are much, much better. I said, how's this job that you weren't enjoying? He goes, love it. Really, really enjoy my work. And the point I'm trying to make there is that did he have a mental health problem? Again, he had symptoms that were consistent, right? You could make some sort of diagnosis there if you wanted to, potentially. But I'm just trying to make the case that he probably had a deficiency of passion in his life, right? And when he corrected his deficiency of passion, 
things started to come back online. So again, my request to each and every single one of you is, when was the last time you did something that you absolutely love? If it's recently, great. If it's not, I'd love you to think about giving you know, regular doses of passion the same priority that you would go to the gym or moving your body. It's as important, yet we don't feel we've got time for it. If you think you don't have time, even five minutes a day. We've all got five minutes a day. It could be reading a book, going for a walk, listening to a podcast, coming home from work, putting on YouTube and watching your favorite comedian for five minutes. It doesn't matter, but a daily dose of pleasure and passion is super important. There are so many other things we could talk about when it comes to stress, but I really want to touch on those two things because I don't think we're talking about them enough and I think they're important. But I just want to leave you with this. Stress does not take a day off in the 21st century, so I don't think we can take a day off from managing stress. I think we all need a stress reduction uh, strategy these days. I really do. And what we don't realize is that stress is everywhere. Okay? Just because we can't see it like we can see the food on our plate doesn't mean it's not there. It is there. It affects our short-term health and our long-term health. I mean, the research is now suggesting that chronic stress is a causative factor in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's doesn't happen overnight. Alzheimer's starts about 30 years before you get it in your brain. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying that to empower you so that you actually take this seriously and start doing simple things each day that really make a difference. I promise you, once you make managing stress a daily priority, not only will your stress levels come down, but you're going to start, being, you're going to start feeling calmer, happier, and I think you'll start to lead a much more fulfilling life. And what could be better than that? Thank you very much.